You're listening to the Career Jump Podcast. Insights, interviews, and success stories to inspire and give you the edge when you make your next career jump. Hosted by your career concierge, Andrew McCaskill. Hello, and welcome back to the Executive Career Jump Podcast. I'm your host and career concierge, Andrew McCaskill. And I'm delighted today to be joined by Jenny Hallam. Thanks for coming to join us today. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. Now, I'm fully aware in terms of your profile about all of the training, facilitation, career coaching and exec coaching you've done. But for the listeners that aren't aware of you previously, tell us a little bit more about your background and and what you get involved with. Okay, so the long story is that basically I've been teaching, training, facilitating people all my life, you know, literally since I was 21. People are my thing. So I spent a a lot of years in education, teaching teachers and doing CPD. And just it was all about, it's always been for me about people achieving their potential. So when I shifted across into coaching, career coaching had never been my intention. It kind of happened by accident. You know, I started working with a few people, I've always been able to write. I knocked up a few CVs and then an opportunity arose for me actually to be employed as a career coach. So I did three and a half years employed as a career coach in a, in a city company and um, realized that I loved it. And what I loved about it was that ability to help people in transition. Because I think it's, it, you know, it's, it's a really tough thing when you have to change when it's not a choice but I know because I've actually been through redundancy three times myself what a great opportunity it can be so I think it's you know being able to help people make that shift see it as an opportunity and create a great future nothing better no it's tremendous it's such a we're lucky aren't we because it's very rewarding work that we get to uh, to do so talk to us a little bit more about the redundancy journey then the I think the mental side of it's really underestimated, isn't it? And I know mindset and things are topics of interest and, and knowledge of yours. So talk to us about talk to us about the whole redundancy process for people. Yeah. So I think, I mean, obviously it varies enormously. Some people know a long time in advance that it's going to happen. But what I'm seeing at the moment, particularly over this last year, is a lot of organizations where it's it, it you know, the hatchet is falling quickly. And people are told and then the whole process is before they've even you know finished recoiling I think it's exceptionally tough especially when it comes like that on an emotional front because and particularly for people who may have been involved in an organization for a long time because of your association with the place you work you know we we identify don't we into into our work and you're in we thinking, and suddenly you're not we anymore. And that's a hard thing to do. And at that time, when you're going through what's often a bit of a confidence crisis for many people, you've got to be at your best because you've got to sell yourself. So I think it makes it incredibly tough. And I always start with clients explaining to them that we're we're going to address two sides of it, of the, the issue, so to speak. And that we are going to be looking at the practical stuff and the CVs and LinkedIn profiles and networking and job searching. But actually, we're going to start with how they feel and, and addressing that and, you know, looking at the kind of pattern of feelings that they're likely to go through because being yeah. prepared is part of it, isn't it? So I think it's, it's, it's everything. important. I totally agree. And it's fantastic that you're addressing that up front as well because you see people in this self-fulfilling prophecy of not going to interview before they're ready, getting knocked back and then further having going down in that confidence cycle and that confidence loop. So, you know, people that are going through this change process, you know, it's a grieving, it's a grieving process, really. It is. I I love your piece about, you know, going from we to not being part of the we anymore. That's a a really interesting way to, to describe it. What can people be doing to look after themselves and to navigate that grieving element to the change? Um, so I don't know if you're familiar or our listeners are familiar with the Kubler-Ross curve. I expect you've come across that, but um, 
you know, I think that applies very effectively to a redundancy journey, that sort of early stage of denial. And then, you know, when you, you can't deny it anymore, becoming angry, and then the kind of nadir point where you can become very pressed and apathetic. And I think it's important to be aware that you are going to go through those stages. They may not be, you know, you might not sink into the depths of despair, but there are there will be some elements of emotional disturbance. So awareness is half the battle. And then I think the other thing is giving yourself permission uh, to have a bit of time out, not trying to force yourself into, you know, everything has to happen right away. You know, even if it's days, but preferably, you know, give yourself at least a week to just have a break and look after yourself. And, you know, there's all kinds of look after yourself things that you can do in our current world. Some of them are restricted. But, you know, what I recommend people to do uh, when they can is actually, if you can, go away. Just go away for a few days somewhere so that it gives you that space between the event and what comes next. And then I think the other thing is to give you, again, give yourself permission to to dream at that point, you know, so if you turn it round on yourself and you see the redundancy as an opportunity, which it is because it's opening up what your future could be. So instead of just letting it happen or doing what I hear a lot of people say, which is, oh, well, you know, I'm going to have to lower my sights and maybe drop back a bit in my ambitions. No, absolutely not. It's a time to think big and to think creative. And interestingly, something I'm seeing a lot of at the moment is people, you know, senior level people coming out and deciding they're going to run their own show. Mm. Lots of people going into consultancy and some people moving right out and doing something completely different. I've been amazed by how many people have set up businesses in the last year. (laughs) Loads. Yeah, I think it's just people at home kind of reassessing everything. Yeah. And I also think where there hasn't been as many roles, people have got into this idea, well, if if I can't find the work I want, I'm going to create it. Mm. I think that's been one of the positives, actually. You know, it's been a ridiculous, ridiculously hard year. Good. Mm. Okay. Some fantastic guidance there. Thanks, Jenny. So once... um, people have started to reframe and see some of the opportunities that exist, um, they're going to be out interviewing, right? People don't like the interview process, do they? That's for <laughs> sure. So I wonder what, what tips and, and guidance you had for people once they do start getting out their interview. Yeah. So I really, that you know, what I'd say about interviews is pretty much the same thing as I've already said, which is, you know, the, the state of mind is just as important as the content. It's, you know, if you, you can do all the preparation in the world for an interview. You can practice questions till you're blue in the face, but if you're not feeling right, it's not going to work. It's just not going to work. So it's that getting yourself into the right frame of mind for you. And I think that's the other thing is that people are different as they are in everything. You know, we communicate differently, we process differently and how we need to be to succeed an interview is different. So it's, it's focusing on that, you know, what's the best state for me to be in? So when I've had this conversation with clients, you know, sometimes it comes out that they, they want to be a bit nervous, a bit on edge, have a bit of adrenaline, because that's mm. what makes them really sharp and focused. And another person will be more like, more like I am, whereas, you know, I, I need to go in super calm, you know, not quite catatonic, but really low, low energy, because I'm a very high energy person. And if I go into an interview high energy, I'm just going to blast the whole room out and it's, it's not going to work. I won't listen properly. So it's, it's knowing, understanding how you perform best from a mindset point of view and getting a kind of mindset strategy in place alongside all that research and content and question practice love that and i love the tailored nature to your advice there because i think there's a lot of one size fits all type advice that's given out oh just go and do this and you'll be fine whereas everybody is different and they're having that self-awareness what works for one person won't work for the other that's that's a great great point 
very good. Okay, I think we've uh, covered some great ground there on the mental side of all of this, um, which is huge. It's everything. So thank you for doing so. What about CVs then? Switching gears a little bit. Again, lots and lots of advice online and people get overwhelmed, don't they, with all the different opinions on CVs. But what's your yeah. take uh, in terms of what a good CV looks like in this environment? Okay, so I'd say number one CV tip is keep it simple. You know, I think people really can end up very much overcomplicating the message in, in all kinds of ways, both, you know, in the way they present and just, you know, what do people need to know? What they're interested in is, you know, if you think about it, the person is a product, you know, you're a product. What do you do? What can you do for us? What value do you add? So achievements come first achievement basis and don't use three words when you can use one <laughs> so you know as somebody who can talk for England and you know I love beautiful writing and elegant language but when I come to do CV writing with people I'm all for simplicity just get the message across <laughs> yeah that's what it's about yeah 100 percent. and you know businesses are looking for people right now who can cut through complexity and help get to help them get to a point of clarity so if your cv is overly complex you're actually kind of signaling to them that you might not be the person to help them with that problem yeah totally so you've got to be super super careful uh in terms of over engineering so i like that yeah nice and simple and i guess what would i describe that as it's like reader centric right like so almost in the same way as websites are designed to be easy for customers. You want your CV to be easy to digest, don't you? you want Absolutely. It to be yeah, it's, it's about what the job of a CV is. You know, the job of a CV is, you know, it's a marketing document for you. It needs to just give the information quickly and easily that's going to get the outcome that you want, which yeah. is actually people to talk to you, isn't it? Yes, <laughs> you know? exactly. So yeah. what's going to make people want to talk to you? And I think another thing about CVs, you see an awful lot of stuff, you know, on the advice online about it must be this length, it must be that length. And, you know, I think it's it's the length it needs to be to do you justice, but also to do its job. So something that's too long, people are not going to read. No. So if you need to go on, you know, if you're a senior person and you need to go on to a third page in order to actually give people the information that they need to have, so be it. You know, I wouldn't panic about that, but just make sure that everything you're putting in your CV, they do really need to know. Mm. Well, people write it as if it's going to be the hiring decision is not going to be made on the CV. The, the idea of the CV is to get an interview. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, it's the trailer, not the movie, as as we said in the post we put out. Like, it's true, isn't it? It's, yeah, exactly. Totally. totally. So yeah. at, at the end of some of these interview processes, we're seeing lots of presentations being put in as the final stage I, I totally get that from the employer's point of view because you want to see people in action and outside of interview mode now you've literally spent your entire career presenting to <laughs> people of all sizes backgrounds ages so I have to ask you about presentations while we're lucky enough to have you on today so what would your tips be in terms of how people can present well and what does a good presentation look like and I guess really interestingly what do people get wrong Okay, so I'm going to sound like a, a broken record here because what I'd say about presentations is keep it simple. I yeah. think the biggest thing that people get wrong is to overcomplicate things again. If they're using slides, you know, it's the death by PowerPoint thing. Slides are great, but what slides should be is a visual anchor for what you've got to say. And, you know, use images and a few words, but no more than that. I was watching a presentation somebody did at a, a meeting I was in this morning and, you know, every slide had so many words on it and you couldn't read them because they were too small and it was a complete turn off. And because the slides were so complicated, you weren't really listening to what she said. So it's that. And I think it's also sticking to the point. It does also apply to answers to interview questions. You know, people tend to think they've got to put in every single thing. Oh, I really want them to know this, that, and that, and that, and that. So how can I get that? How can I slide that into this? And, you know, if you've been asked to present on a topic, or if you're being asked a question, just stick to that. That's what's going to endear you most to your interviewers. If you're sticking to what 
they have asked you to present on. And you then think inside that. So I think a good presentation addresses an issue, but it also raises questions. Mm. So it goes a bit beyond mm. what they've asked for, but in a way that maybe asks them questions back. Mm. So, that would definitely make it more memorable. Yes. Yeah. And uh, one, one more, this may sound like a very silly tip, but I've seen people do it so often. If you are presenting live, don't stand in front of your slides. <laughs> it's classic. People do do that so often. Yeah. They've got, um, they've got, sometimes got some, uh, I remember in the old, you'd have people who had some of the projector, like projecting on the half of their face yeah. or something. At, at and, and, you know, at this time when we're all doing it online, <laughs> practice first with your mm. technology. Because again, I had somebody the other day doing a presentation and they obviously hadn't gone through it first and the slides weren't working properly and this strange black square kept popping up across the middle of their slides and it ruined the whole thing. It was a very good presentation, but it was completely ruined. So, you know, that's the equivalent of standing in front of your slides, isn't it? A hundred percent, yeah. And way more common than you might think, sadly. Yes, so, yes it is. Okay, some cracking guidance there. Hey everybody, it's uh, Andrew here. Just wanted to very briefly interrupt this podcast episode to tell you a little bit more about our Career Jump Club. So our Career Jump Club was created to help job seekers understand what they want and how to get it, right? So becoming a club member is a great move if you're looking to get the clarity and confidence in order to secure your next role. With the membership, you get a number of different things. So First thing you get is access to our online platform, which has over 30 videos, 40, 50 different templates, workbooks, and it takes you through everything from sort of understanding what you want to how to position your CV and LinkedIn, how to interview, how to close offers and negotiate better salaries, a full end to end job search course effectively for senior leaders. So you get that, you get a fortnightly group coaching call. Um, which is with me and with the other members where we bounce around best practice, share slide decks, share techniques and share the latest data on what's working for people. And you get to most importantly become part of our closed LinkedIn group and our closed community. And in there is where the magic often happens because you get people referring each other into opportunity, supporting each other and just share it. And that's what it's all about. So if you're financially able and you'd like to invest in your job search, head on over to www exec exec careerjump.com or one word forward slash club and you'll find the landing page and come and give it a go we'll see you in there anyway back to the pod what else do you think people are getting wrong in terms of their job searching in their careers thinking wider than presentations now what kind of i think I've already mentioned one of the things which I, I think is that kind of mentally restricting themselves and saying, oh, I'm, you know, I'm too old for this. I'm too late for that. Yeah. I'll have to look for lower posts, that kind of thing. I think being sometimes over-reliant on the advertised job market mm. and maybe not spending, you know, I think the two things run in parallel. Yes, we're looking at what's already out there, but, you know, the network and the referral recommendation side of things, you know, if I look back over the last two or three years, particularly amongst the clients that I've worked with, so many of them have ended up doing what they do now through people in the network. Mm. And, and, you know, just really simple things like, you know, when you come to LinkedIn and you're looking at somebody's LinkedIn profile and you say, okay, so you've got, you know, 350 connections. So, um, so are you connected with, with all the people that you've been working with in the organization you just worked with? No. Okay. And what about the organization before that? And so what about your friends? Mm -hmm. No. <laughs> just all this opportunity that's there for connection. And as soon as you're connected to people, you can, you can give help to them and you can ask for them to help you. And it's, yeah. you know, it's, it's just three clients that I've spoken to just this week. All three of them are currently working, albeit on, you know, projects, short-term things, but they are all projects that came through somebody they either knew from an organisation they previously worked for or who was a client. 
I'd say, oh, you're available. Will you come and do this for us? Of course. That's exactly um, how it works. And yet, so we talk about checking people into job search, job advert rehab, as we describe it, because people get totally hooked on just applying for roles and it's the lowest yeah. rate of any channel. And the other thing you touched on there, which is a really important point, is the amount of times that the likes of you and I start working with a client and we're starting from such a low base in terms of their connections and their CV. And for anyone reading this who's in post or about to start a new job, commit to yourself that you'll continue to work on these things whilst you're in a job. Oh, make, goodness, yes. Just <laughs> make, make, make this like an ongoing thing. After every quarterly appraisal, update the numbers on your CV. After, you know, conti continue to build your personal brand even when you don't really need it because mm -hmm. your, your future self is going to thank you for it. I can't tell you the amount of people we sat down with at the moment trying to remember the percentage they saved in 2009. Yes. On their ITs, and, it, and you're just like, wow, we've got to document this as we go. These are really important things, your network, your CV, keep them going, right? Absolutely. Yes. You, you, yeah. You sound just like me. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I do. I, I think it's just so important and it's it makes life so much easier um, to be just recording what you're doing, recording your achievements as you're achieving them. Um, but it's also really good for you. It's mm. really good for your self-esteem. Mm. If you are actually noticing how good you are as you're being good, you know, rather than leaving it till you know five or six years later when you've got to write a cv and suddenly you've got to remember when you were good <laughs> yeah it's the um, reinforcing nature of it it's a really good point yes absolutely and and you just nicked my quote you know we were talking about a quote that's my quote do something today that your future self will thank you for oh is it, I'm, it is so my i didn't quote. know that <laughs> um but that's no, it's a great one it's an awesome one and i love that um yeah. Because if, if we apply that to life and we do something every day that our future self will thank us for, then we're going to make progress. We are. Yeah. What is it about humans that stops us doing that? The, the instant gratification thing, you know, I, mean, I, I didn't start paying into a pension until I was 30, I don't think. You know, <laughs> you, you know what I mean? Like, we just don't invest enough into tomorrow, do we? No, I think it's also I, I think we can get very stuck in what's happening now. Mm. especially when it's a bit of a negative time, you know, you just kind of get <laughs> and mm. block off the future. And I, I also think that people, I think it sometimes ha happens as people get older, that they, they develop kind of fear about the future. So they don't think about it. Mm. So, yeah, but I think if you apply that principle to life in general, you can't go far wrong. Well, I love it. I'm sorry. I half stole the quote. I think you added a bit <laughs> on. So I'm still feeling good about that. <laughs> what about leaders are readers, right? So what, what about books that you've enjoyed or that have had an impact on some of your thinking or you would recommend okay. to me? So first one I was going to mention is this. Have you read that? How does no, it happen? That's a new anyone? one by Sherry Harley. So this was introduced to me quite recently. Um, I'm involved in business networking organisations and uh, so someone in one of those organisations introduced this as... What as, was the title again? Sorry, just for our audio listeners. Say, how to say anything to anyone. Yes. And it's by a lady called Sherry Harley. Mm. It was actually originally published, I think, in 2013, but I didn't come across it until this last year. But it's just, it's basically about how we talk to people and how, how massively important that is in building business relationships that really work. Whether that's you as a leader, you as an employee, uh, you in a collaboration, you in a networking group, um, and feedback. One of the key things in there is how to give feedback effectively. And the model that she offers, just think it's a seven point model for giving feedback. It's awesome. And, it, it, you know, and I say within this group, we've kind of implemented that this year. And it's made such a difference to relationships between people it's just it's almost cut out any level of misunderstanding and there's about 50 60 people in this group so i love that and fee feedback yeah anything related to feedback is well worth a read so and it's nice to, nice to hear a new one as well I, it's a new one for me so that's good what else is uh would you, would um, you recommend? so my, my other two are probably much more familiar to everyone uh the first one is the power of now Echo. oh yeah 
Hall, which um, I'm, I'm sure you've heard of and many people have yeah, heard Yeah, we've got it over here in the uh, bookshop. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, it, I remember when I first read that and that whole message about just letting go of the past and releasing concerns about the future and just being in the moment and how much more you get out of life that way. I think, you know, purely as a a happiness thing, it's enormous. But actually, in terms of getting things done, I find it really helpful too, because if I'm just in now, everything is about what I'm doing now, then I'm focused on what I'm doing and not off on some what if journey or memory journey. You know, I don't believe that those things don't have a value because they do. And I think engaging with your past can have real value and certainly envisioning your future has real value. But, a, but as a, you know, a general sort of life improver, I think Power of Now is just awesome. And it's, it, you know, it's, it's clearly put, you know, it's, it's not too waffly. No, it's not. It's, well, it's yeah, a hugely successful book for that reason. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely. It's easily digestible. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit more on that. Right? I'm interested on in that. So what, where does the balance lie for you between doing something every day for your future self versus the power of now? Like, how do those um, two things interlock? I don't think they're mutually exclusive at all. So if my overriding kind of philosophy is that I'm going to do ev- something every day, that my future self will thank me for, then that empowers me in the moment. Mm. So, you know, every moment of everything I do, the aim is to be fully engaged with it and fully aware in the moment. This is, you know, it's, it was, <laughs> it's a bit difficult to explain really, but I, but I think it's something that that's um, I've got so much better at doing I've got um, much more effective at it as I've got older. Um, it's about stilling the mind and the chatter and the busyness and all those things and just being able to focus in on what's happening right now. And do you engage with mindfulness or meditation or anything like that to help you with that task or not? Yes. Well, I think, again, meditation is one of those things which you find your own way of doing. Mm. You know, I don't think the sort of, you know, conventional idea of meditation is somebody sitting still with their eyes closed. And I do do some of that. And uh, but in my day to day life, a lot of my meditative times come from doing. So I do Pilates, for example, I do a lot of Pilates. And I actually find that if I'm focusing completely on my body, which you are when you're doing Pilates exercises, because if you don't, you'll fall over. Um, <laughs> and, you know, that and feeling like the, the stretch through all the muscles and where exactly my, you know, my uh, spiral muscle chain is and all that kind of stuff. That's meditative for me because it's clearing my mind of other stuff. The other thing that's meditative for me is drawing. Mm. Um, yeah eons ago I went to art school and you know that was what I was going to do with my life and I kind of left drawing for for a long time and I've come back and it's quite interesting I've got several clients who are ex-artists as well and who've gone down different routes you know corporate roles and um, there's a kind of trend going on which I'm encouraging amongst everybody to get back to drawing which has sort of happened partly through lockdown so sitting here in my office, you know, I've got my little box of watercolour crayons here. And in my in my breaks, if you like, I sit here and draw. I love that. And the, the incredible po- popularity, I'm told, of adult colouring in books. Yeah. Over the last, you know, yeah. few years. There is something very, very releasing to the mind about colour and pattern. And, you know, I think it's lovely to just draw freely you don't have to draw things you just see what happens you know it's like um I used to teach art and you know one of the classic things that you do with kids is called take a line for a walk but actually that's what you do when you draw you're just you know you're taking marks on a journey Mm. so I think that's even more 
therapeutic for want of a better word than coloring in but coloring in if that's you know if that works for people do it seems to be doing it yeah i've just seen yeah as i say a lot of these kind of older style hobbies you know knitting's massive again yeah same yeah. thing when you think about what you're doing you're creating you're meditatively yeah. putting your cognitive worries aside and focusing on a on a uh, it's interesting isn't it yes and i think it's i think it's lovely and you know and it's a good thing and i hope that you know when the whole covid thing is over and we're all back in our busy busyness that people don't lose that so do i but i don't actually think we will i think it's one of the good things that's come out of this year mm. i think people have engaged a lot more with their if you like inner selves mm. um and perhaps have have refound those things you know things she used to love doing as a child and so on and started to do them again and once you found it you know hopefully you you're not going to give it up no well i certainly hope that's the case yeah. So what was book number three out of interest? Oh, book number three is Lean In, Sheryl Sandberg. Yeah, uh, classic. Um, again, you're probably not surprised by that. One of the things that I really like about it, and I don't agree with everything in it, and I do, you know, there, there, there have been lots of discussions about what it doesn't address and so on, but I was lucky enough to, a few years ago, to see Sheryl Sandberg speak in a private events so you know it wasn't a huge number of people there so uh, and this was after her husband died and it was really moving but she did refer back to lean into and and how it had the evolution of it over the years since she wrote it and one of the things I think comes out really strongly from it is her understanding about parents and that the issues are about equality for both sexes it's not that it's about women it's about people mm. And I really, you know, I think that is such an important thing for us all to remember in the world of work, that it's not about men and women, it's about people. Yes, and coming Uh, together to solve these challenges. Yeah, and it isn't that men and women are different, it's that people are different, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, and and honouring what's the strengths that different people have and how they work most effectively together. And if you if you work like that, if you stop putting people into boxes and you just think about the qualities and skills that people have, then everything works better. But, you know, I think we've I think we've made progress since 2013 in some ways and in other ways we haven't. But I think that book will always be an important one for people. I'm not going to say women for people to read. Mm. I got a lot out of it. I enjoyed reading it. Mm. Yeah. So, you know, those are three of my books. There are lots. I love books. <laughs> yeah. So uh, leaders and readers or listeners now as well with podcasts like yeah. and various other things. But no, yeah. three absolutely tremendous recommendations. And thanks for sharing openly your interpretation of them as well. It's nice to hear you talk about that. Um, so in t- if somebody wanted to follow up with you and find you, what's the best way to get in touch with you, Jenny? Um, well, I love it when people connect with me on LinkedIn. That's always yeah. great. Um, my contact details are actually on my LinkedIn profile as well. So my email address, Jenny at jennyhallam.co.uk. You can go to my website. But yeah, I'd say I love it when people come to me on LinkedIn, not just the I want to connect with you, but they actually send me a message. A and personalized say, message. I heard you on Andrew's podcast and yeah. I'd love to have a chat. You know, that's, well, that's brilliant. Well, I'm very confident based on all the value that you've shared today that 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 you're going to get plenty of those. So thank you again for investing the time. I think some of the mindset tips and the holistic nature to the advice you've given today is brilliant. So really, really appreciate it. I know you're busy, so thank you for doing that. And if you're listening and you want to get in touch with Jenny, please do follow up with a personalised message and uh, connect with her on LinkedIn. In the meantime, keep safe and well. And thanks everyone for listening. Thank you. Take care. You've been listening to the Career Jump podcast with Andrew McCaskill. For more resources and information, just head over to the Career Jump website at www.execcareerjump.com to supercharge your job search and start making moves. Let's get to work. Let's get to work.